desiccation of the region. The Coconino sandstone and its sort of counterpart or correlative uh, in part, the uh, Deche sandstone over in Canyon Deche, were formed in a dune environment. Not something like the Sahara or the Namib Desert, but a coastal dune field. Um, a little bit smaller than the big dune fields that we think of in Africa today. But in these dunes were wandered all kinds of really interesting creatures. We don't actually know who made these, but we have some ideas. These are little tracks, you can see the claw marks here, and little heel marks here. Walking up the face of these ancient dunes, these were preserved in, uh, in this sandstone. And we think that these were made by a little guy who was, again, kind of related to those reptiles that became that went on to become mammals. We also find here, these little dots in odd patterns are spider tracks. And one of the reasons that I know this is because I had a pet tarantula, and I wandered around the halls of the geology department with my pet tarantula named Rose, and I ran her up and down sand hills to find out what kind of tracks she made. And what's interesting is her tracks are absolutely identical to these tracks. Doesn't mean these are tarantulas, but it means that anything with eight legs probably likely to make a, a pretty common trap. So we find uh, spider traps, scorpion traps, um, worm burrows. We don't find any body fossils at all in the Coconino sandstone. But this is the kind of environment that we think might have uh, left us the Coconino sandstone. The final gasp of the Permian, at least on the Colorado Plateau, and it isn't the last of the Permian, but for us it is, is um, this is the Coconino sandstone. Here's the Tormoweed formation and the Kaibab formation. And again, best preserved in Grand Canyon. This represents one last gasp of the ocean moving in across the land. And when we look at what we're finding, we find sponges. Here's a sponge fossil right here. Um, brachiopods, which are shellfish that look very superficially like clams and are nowhere near related to them but they are shellfish, uh, very common in this time period. Uh, here's another horn coral right here. And this is even a very fuzzy picture of, it was taken very late in the evening, of a fish, the upper, uh, the palate of a fish. Right out near Shoshone Point in the uh, Grand Canyon. And all of these tell us that again, once again, this ocean, this sort of uh, shallow, warm, tropical ocean, crinoids living on the edges you find skates and rays, we have shark teeth, and even these coiled monoids there. If you go to the sea vent at Grand Canyon, they've got some of these in the walls, and they also have some fake ones too, so it's kind of fun to figure out <laughs> what they look like. Okay, <laughs> on to the reptiles. <laughs> all right, now with the end of the Permian, like I said, the, all the continents had, had amassed together as Pangaea, and it wasn't very long after that that Pangaea began to break up. And the Colorado Plateau region split away um, with a good portion of the rest of North America and began to travel to the north, northwest. And uh, so all of these changes in, in uh, location, latitude, uh, elevation of sea level we find reflected in the, in the fossil record. The Mesozoic period beginning about 250 million years ago is what we call the age of dinosaurs or the age of reptiles. And we find dinosaurs in the oddest places. But it took a little while into the Mesozoic for the dinosaurs to appear. Now the Mesozoic, this is uh, Jurassic, Triassic and Jurassic aged rocks. Um, you find them again up at Dinosaur National Monument over in Grand Staircase Escalante and uh, all across the central portion of the plateau here. These locations are, again, the broad locations. Um, I talked to uh, Jim Kirkland, who is the Utah State Paleontologist in, in Utah a little while ago. He said that essentially the Mesozoic record on the Colorado Plateau is the best record in the world. Um, we are finding some things in the Mesozoic from the Colorado Plateau that are changing the face of paleontology, or at least if other paleontologists will agree, will change the face of paleontology. There's a lot of disagreement about some of this stuff. So early into the Triassic, not, not very long after Pangaea assembled, you can see it started to break apart. And this had some very interesting repercussions for our part of the world. The early Triassic, the time period when the Moenkopi formation, red rocks out there near Cameron were being deposited, you can see here that this is all 
now out of the water, and here's our coastline. By the late Triassic, look how far the coastline has moved back out to central Nevada, and you have a huge river system flowing from the south and the southeast out of the highlands and across this region. Here's the little remnants of those ancestral Rockies. And these river systems, these massive Mississippi of the Triassic, huge floodplains and huge channels, is what left us one of the more famous uh, formations of the whole plateau, the Chinle Formation. This is found in the Painted Desert. It's found in the Canyonlands. This is very, very common. Its equivalent is found in Texas. These river systems were very, very big, and they left these beautiful, muddy, shaly uh, formations all across the plateau. And in the Chinle Formation, we find the earliest dinosaurs on the plateau. These are some of the earliest dinosaurs in the world, not the earliest, though. Everybody wants to have the earliest, the biggest, the scariest, the smallest, whatever. Um, this is one of them, but it's not. It's not. This is a little guy called Coelophysis, and Coelophysis is really famous in Flagstaff because um, Ned Colbert did a lot of work over at Ghost Ranch uh, in New Mexico, where you also find the Chinle Formation. And at Ghost Ranch, we learned some very interesting things about these guys. Apparently, they moved around in herds or in large groups. Either that, or somehow we amassed what may have been as many as 10,000 of these creatures in one deposit that is being, currently being excavated and, and worked on um, over at Ghost Ranch and here at uh, m and and I think Peabody has a block of it. Here are these little guys, they're about six to eight feet long, uh, nose to tip to tail, bipedal, walk around on two legs, short little arms, very definitely carnivores. And what's really interesting, here's, uh, this gives you an idea, this is a head and the neck, here's another one right here, but here's the head and the neck, and this bent back position is really common among uh, what, you know, when animals die, the tendons on the back of the neck shorten up. So you'll see a lot of these guys that have a, a bent neck like this. Um, come down to the rib cage, arms, legs, and out to the tail. Well, this little rib cage here has actually some other bones in it. And they're little Coelophysis bones. And at first, when, when uh, paleontologists saw this, they thought, uh, oh my gosh, stop the presses. Coelophysis gave live birth. They gave birth to babies without yes. eggs, like reptiles are supposed to do. And then they got the hold of themselves and took a little bit closer look at these bones in here in the ribcage area. And they realized that these were not neo or prenatal babies. These were or prenatal uh, dinosaurs. These were actually just very young, but they were out of the womb and instead into the stomach. So apparently, these guys not only ate lizards and you know frogs and amphibians and things like that, but also their own kind. Um, in addition to Coelophysis, the Chile ecosystem, and you have to petrify forest and a fantastic uh, you know, displays about this. The Chile ecosystem was just unbelievable. It's a, it's a sort of a warm, subtropical environment. Um, the, probably the biggest predator of the day because the dinosaurs were still small. It's this big alligator-like or crocodile-like creature called a rudiodontus, a phytosaur. And you see these teeth here? Okay, another interesting little side note. Phytosaur, the word phyto means plant. Phytosaur means plant lizard. Well, this is another one of these great stories where the first skull that they found, the teeth had been knocked out and there were just these little pegs of, of uh, sediment up in there filling in the sockets. And so they thought, oh, well, this guy eats plants. And they named it Phytosaur. And then they found one with the teeth. <laughs> and they went, oh, okay, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> oh, well, the name's there, can't do anything about it. So, uh, Phytosaurs were, they got up to 30 feet long, huge creatures. They lived uh, you know, in the water and out of the water. They were reptiles and amphibians. And um, not related to the dinosaurs, different branch of the reptiles, but very, very dangerous creatures. These guys are great. These are amphibians. These are the Metoposaurs. They're called labyrinthodont amphibians. Their teeth have this labyrinthine kind of infolding of the enamel. And we, we sort of um, oh, affectionately call them shovel heads uh, because they had these big flat heads that sometimes took up like a third of their body length. And they got up to six, eight feet long. They were amazing creatures. They didn't appear in the Chinle Formation. We find them earlier than that, but these guys are pretty famous. You find those throughout the Chile. A lot of other things during this time, in addition to the clams and the snails. 
stuff like that. This is a very primitive bony fish here. And then this really interesting little lizard that's mostly known from back east. This is, you're thinking, okay, lizard, fish, what's wrong with this picture? Well, look at this guy's feet. He had webbed feet. They find it in river deposits. So apparently this guy was swimming around in the water with these very primitive bony fish. 